Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Hoping my voice sticks out for this. Thank you, Lord. Oh, thank you, Lord. I just, I just thank God today that I'm standing here. I, this week's been rough, so I just praise Him for the strength. Amen. And I just, I just honor you, Bishop, for giving me the opportunity to speak this weekend. And I'm just excited. So let me open in prayer and then I'll get into it because I got a, a little bit of a word for you. All right. Father, we just thank you today, Lord. I just ask that you help me, God. Give me strength, Lord. Speak through me, Lord. Have your way in this place, God. I just ask that you prepare the hearts of your people today to receive your word. Lord, I just pray that uh, it would just touch them somewhere and it would um, give them something to apply to their lives, Lord, that they would not leave here the same God, we just thank you that you're the same yesterday, today, and forever, that you're always there for us, that you hold us up when we're having a hard time, Lord. And we just thank you for your presence in this place, Lord. I just, just have your way. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So I have the pleasure of, of closing out the Truth series for the month before we move on to our new month. Uh, like Linda was saying, this time is flying by. It's crazy. Um, I was thinking a month ago about, you know, my time that I would be speaking, and I'm like, hey, by the time we get to the end of the month, everyone's going to say everything I would have said. <laughs> but he gave me some things um, that he wanted me to share with you guys, and um, I was here for during the 10 days, and I was laying down upstairs, and um, I closed my eyes, and I was trying to go to bed, and couldn't go to sleep. He, he just, you know, starts giving me all these things. And so I'm like, well, how am I going to, like, tie this together, because I have a couple different topics. As usual, I got a lot to say. So, um, you know, I just closed my eyes and, and I saw my dad's workshop. Now my dad, he's been a machinist my whole life. He does woodworking, he can build or fix, I'm convinced, anything. And, but he also has like at least 5,000 tools. Like my whole life, like we had a, 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 a house with a garage and he filled that thing and now they live out in the country and have a giant pool barn and that's pretty much filled as well. But what um, I was like, God, why are you show me this? Like, what does this have anything to do, you know, all these tools? Like, what does it mean? And he was telling me that truth, like each piece of truth is like a tool. And so one tool isn't for every job. You need multiple. So you need lots of truth. And the point is, is that it grows over time. You're growing in God's truth over time. And so, you know, uh, whether you're working with a tool belt, you got a toolbox, you know, maybe you've got a garage or an entire pool barn like my dad. <laughs> The point is that uh, your amount of tools grows over time. So he gave me a couple things that, um, you know, I've learned over the last couple of years, things that have made uh, the Christian walk, I don't know, easier, but just, just things that I could fall back on when I need information, uh, when I need truth to hold on to, when this world is confusing and um, when I need help. <laughs> so. Um, I believe that discipleship is passing that truth down to each other. And so, you know, I have some of these tools in my toolbox and I, I, want, to, I want you to leave here today with those in yours. So um, I can't be in two places at once, so I can't put things up on the screen for you. So if you have paper, um, jot down a little bit of, of this if you would, um, or your phone or whatever. Um, but when I, when I talk about truth, I'm talking about God's wisdom. I'm talking about God's truth, not about all this information that's out here in the world. During the 10 days, someone was talking about like information and the, and the way it's been replicating over time. And um, someone was saying like now because of like the internet and everything, like there's new information out in the world like once an hour or once every 30 minutes and it's just getting faster and faster. But I'm talking about God's wisdom, God's truth and where do we find that? In his work. Right? And if we don't have wisdom or we can't find something specific, then we pray yes. and we ask him to give us that wisdom. So um, um, I think it's really important that we have that foundation, that stable foundation on his word, because you can't have kind of the world's wisdom mixed in with God's wisdom. In James, it tells you that that's double minded. Um, if you're if you're kind of teeter tottering between something, when the wind or the waves come, you're going to fall. Yeah. You're going to you're going to you're going to just lose it, right? So um, that's what I'm talking about today, okay? So um, I have four. I'm going to say I'm going to do three. If I have time, I'll share the fourth one. It was five, so I'm, tr I'm trying, y'all. Um, so hang in there with me. Please take notes it, because I, I want you guys to be able to use this stuff later, okay? 
So number one, my first topic is trial is temporary, but triumph is forever. All right, so in 1 Peter, he is writing to Christians that have been driven out of Jerusalem by the Roman Empire. So they have been scattered over the land. They are being persecuted. If they're caught, they're being killed. Um, so Peter wrote this letter to them to encourage them because of all of the hardship that they're going through. And so in 1 Peter um, 6 through 9, it says, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may it be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen you love, though now you do not see him yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. So he says, don't be grieved when you're in various trials and you're going to be tested by fire. Well, those things don't sound too fun, right? <laughs> but um, we, we've learned that trials are part of, part of our refining process. And I believe it's Malachi where he talks about the refiner. And um, God uses this process to shape us to be more like Christ, okay? Like our cornerstone, okay? And um, we have to be shaped to be more useful in the kingdom. And so as metal is melted down by a refiner, all the impurities come up to the top. They're skimmed off and then it's melted more. They're skimmed off. It's a, just a continuum, continuous process until the metal gets that sheen on it to where it's mirror-like. And at this point, the refiner can look down in that metal and see his reflection. And that's the point, is for us to be a reflection of Christ. Okay, so, but, but he puts us through the fire <laughs> to do that, right? So, um, in chapter 2 and 3 of 1 Peter, I want you guys to go home and read this whole book. I'm serious. It's only five chapters. But in chapter 2 and 3, it explains a little bit of how our conduct should be when we're going through trials. Because what do we want to do? Scream and cry and, and, and throw a fit. Like, this isn't fair. Like, are you serious? Right. But, but it says that in the midst of our suffering and trials, we should be honorable and glorifying to God. And the reason is because Christ did that for us. He set that example. Um, in fact, in chapter 2, 21 through 24, it says, For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example, that you should follow his footsteps, who committed no sin, nor was deceit, nor was deceit found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but he committed himself to him who judges righteously, who himself bore our sins in his own body on a tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. Amen? Amen. So he has set the example for us. He was in, like Pilate was in his face and was questioning him and all this stuff, and he didn't say anything. He was spit on, he, they put a crown of thorns on him, they mocked him, and he didn't defend himself. Like, I'm not there yet. I want to be one day, but I'm, you're, you are here. Okay, <laughs> I'm working on it, okay, I'm working on me. But that's the point, is that um, he did this for us to give us an example. And it's now up to us to be the example for other people. Okay, for other Christians, for, for, for people who are weaker than us. And so Carter Conlon said, there are times when people are not open to listen to the gospel, but they will see Christ in you when they see you go through something that you have no strength to go through on your own. And they will see that there is a divine enablement inside of you that allowed you to go through that. We are put in the fire. We, are, we deal with the craziest tragedies and pain on this earth, but with the strength of the Lord, we can get through it. We can't do it on our own. I wouldn't be standing here right now. I'd be in a puddle on the floor. But with him, we can do it, and he has given us that example, and it's our job to be an example to others. So that's why I'm standing here today, is I want to be an example that even though things hurt, and even though there's crazy stuff going on, he is my strength, and that's why I'm here today. And if that's not enough, <laughs> in 2 Corinthians 1, 9 and 10, 
Paul was saying, yes, we had the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead, who delivered us from so great a death and does deliver us in whom we should trust that he will, he will still deliver us because he is faithful. Okay. He will keep us in every single trial that we face. Another quote by Carter Conlon said, learn to find the victory where you are so that when a greater trial comes, you have an increased confidence in God, that the God has, that has kept you in the past will keep you today and tomorrow. So if you haven't got the gist yet, the Christian life isn't easy. I don't know why this is like a, a theme out there in like certain, you know, Christian groups that like, Christianity is easy, it's the good life, it's health, wealth, and prosperity. Like, someone lied to you. I don't know who told you that, because the Bible doesn't say anything about that. And now, I do agree that it's the best life, and it leads to eternal life, but it's not the easy life, right? It's not, it's not like, you know, rainbows all the time. Okay? So, and once again, the word says to expect trials. Just to show you again, um, 1 Peter 4, 12, 13 says, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the, concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. So this means when the trial is over and his glory is revealed, you have triumph at the end of the day, okay? Because he paid it all and he won it for us. So I, I mentioned the fact that he was our chief cornerstone back um, at the beginning for a reason. Let me run over here to Matthew 7 for a minute. So I want to talk about foundation. I said it's so important at the beginning to have a foundation of God's truth. And... In seven, uh, Matthew 7, 24 through 27, it says, Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell and was a great fall. You see, the rain is coming anyway for everyone. It doesn't say the rain's going to fall on the lost and not on the Christian. It says the rain is going to descend, okay? But if you're founded on the rock, you won't fall. If you're on sinking sand, you're on sinking sand. You're falling, okay? All right, so there's no way to avoid the trials. There's no way to avoid the trials. But living on the rock means that you're a real disciple, that you live a life of obedience and sacrifice for the gospel, and that you believe what the Bible has to say. Okay? Having a biblical perspective allows you to realize that we live in a fallen world, that we should expect trials to come. And when these punches come, you can be prepared for them, okay? And um, if you think back on the trials that you've been through before, you're probably not still in them. You could probably list off a whole host of things that you've been through in your life, right? So if the fact that you're not in them now means that there's life on the other side of them, okay? Which can give you a little glimmer of hope for what you're going through now is that there's going to be life on the other side of this one, okay? And the thing is, is it might not be here on earth. You got to be open to the fact that, that uh, your healing or your life might not be here. It might be eternal. Okay, that's just part of that's just part of reality. Um, so I just want to leave you from this topic. I want to leave you with a couple scriptures. So get your pens ready. I'm going to read them out, but just write down the reference so that you can um, run back to them when you need them. Okay, so the first one, I just when you're in a trial, I recommend that you pray for peace. And the scripture that I like is Philippians 4, 7 which says, and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for the good of those who love God to those who are called according to his purpose. Romans 8, 18 says, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And lastly, James 1 and 2 
says, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. So like I said, it might not be here, it might be here, but you're going to be on the other side of the trial eventually, okay? But we have been given victory in our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? So with that being said, trial is temporary, but triumph is forever. All right. Hopefully you can carry that into your next one if you're not in the middle one now. <laughs> All right, so topic number two. How am I doing? All right. All right, so the next one is called, He is the Potter, I am the Clay. All right, so I talked about the refiner in the, in the previous portion, and, um, you know, he's shaping us. Now, the potter and the clay is just another parable of something similar, right? So um, this is in the same vein, but just a little bit different, okay? So in Jeremiah 18, um, the Lord came to Jeremiah and told him to go down to the potter's house. Okay, this, you're going to find this in 18, 1 through 6. And so it says, then I went down to the potter's house and there he was. He was making something at the wheel. And the vessel that he made was, or the, I'm sorry, and the vessel that he made of clay was marred. Marred means it was disfigured. Okay, so it was no good. Um, so it was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again into another vessel as it seemed good to the potter to make. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter? Says the Lord, look, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so you are in my hand. Now, um, he was talking to Judah through, through Jeremiah at this time. And so the, the potter, he has power over the clay, okay? He continues to work on it to try to make it a useful vessel. And the, this, in, the, in the passage there, it was, it was disfigured, it was messed up. So we had to like restart and make it into something because it wasn't gonna work. If it hardened that way, it was no good. And so Judah at this time was hardened against God. They weren't doing what God um, had, had commanded them to do and they weren't being useful. And so God was saying like, if you don't repent Judah, you're gonna harden this way and then you're not being used for your purpose. So there's, you're gonna be broken and destroyed because there's no, per I can't use you. I can't use you. So what God is saying to us is that he wants to use us, but we need to be molded into his image and likeness. We need to be kind of our, our roughness, you know, taken out a little bit so that we can be useful in his kingdom. So I found a really good video on YouTube. I might uh, share this with you guys later, but it's, um, it explains the steps of making a clay pot. Like that, you know, like in the story of like Jesus who turned the, the water and the wine, you know, the big pots that he used for water. So it's, it's a story of these four steps of how to make a pot for water. And so I'm gonna try to just explain them to you. Uh, does, does everyone know like what a, uh, like a potter's wheel is? You know, the round wheel that they sit down at, it spins. Okay, hopefully, I wish I had two hands. Um, I'm gonna try to like, do some charades up here, okay? So I'm gonna explain these four steps, okay? And just listen for what God does with us in these steps, all right? So the first step is to balance the clay, which is called centering. So it's a, the wheel is round, okay, that he's working on, and he has a, a, a step that he's pressing that makes it spin, okay? So you gotta get the lump of clay in the middle of that wheel because if you start spinning it fast, if it's off center, it's just gonna like flop around and fly off and it, it's no good. You have to have it in the center, okay? So, so the, the potter uses his hands to gently nudge because the clay wants to go left and right and sway all over the place in this, on this, on this uh, wheel. But the, the potter's gently nudging back to the center and um, getting it to the, getting this clay to the place that it can be worked on. It can't even be worked on yet till it's centered, okay? So he's saying that God has to be your focal point. You have to even have your eyes on God for him to even be able to touch your life. If you're ignoring him, like what's he gonna do for you? So, so um, you need to be in the middle. And once, you're, once that clay is centered, they call it at rest. So you're at rest in the potter's hands at that point. You're not going anywhere, okay? So that's step one, all right? So step two, 
Step two is the clay is opened, all right? So now there's a lump of clay perfectly centered in the middle of the wheel, and um, it's, it's spinning at this point. He's got it going, and he's using his hands, and he uses his thumbs to push down in the center of that lump on the top, okay? Because it's probably about this, this high, okay? But he's pushing it down, and the point is not to grab the clay and pull it out. The point is to move the clay gently to make a point that he can reach the middle, the heart of the vessel, okay? So at this point, the vessel goes from a lump to a vessel. It has a middle. There's something that you can get into. So it's opened up, and he uses his sponge and water to start cleaning out that middle and just getting into that, into the center of your heart and uh, just working on your heart first, right? He doesn't worry about the outside of you, right? He's just going in, and he's cleaning you out. And so to be open to God is to allow him to start making those changes in you. So he's opening the clay, okay? All right, so step three is that the clay is lifted up. So the, this, this clay is going to be a water pot, okay? Well, this, this short little, you know, round thing with the hole in the middle, it's not going to hold much water, right? So it needs to be brought up into like a large pot. So what the, the potter does is he grabs on from the, like the middle and the outside. There's these thick walls all the way around. And he starts gently lifting up the clay. So, and he's pulling it towards himself. Okay, so at this time, he's gently, gently just pulling the, the walls up. And at this time, the walls get thinner. And they get more fragile in this state because they're exposed because they're a lot thinner than they were. There's not as strong of a base right now. And this is the time where a lot of, um, what's the word, uh, defects can be seen. Okay, there might be cracks, there might be bubbles, there might be holes. Well, what's the point of this pot? It's going to hold water. Okay, so if there's things in your purpose that that he needs you to do, like this is supposed to hold water. So you, this pot can't have a hole, right? So he's gonna use this time to fix those imperfections, but if there's a scratch, it might not matter, okay? So he might choose to leave things in you that don't really affect your purpose. There might be things that you're like, take this away from me, take this illness away, take this whatever it might be, but he might decide to leave those things because you're still able to work in your purpose with those things. So, but, but this is where he gets to choose. He could leave those defects or he could smooth them out and I mean, he could start all over again if he wanted to. But the point is, is that this is where all of those things are, um, are, he brings you closer up to him and all of those things are smoothed out that he doesn't want to remain in you, basically. And so this could be, there's not an amount of time that this could take, it just depends on how long it takes. Okay, so then the last one is called shaping the clay. So at this point, there's a tall cylinder, okay? It's just a straight, tall cylinder, thin walls. You could put water in it, you could stop there if you want to, but usually a clay pot has like a wider base to it and a little bit of a flow and there's a, you know, there's a neck. So he take, he slows the wheel down and he just takes his time and he works on every little detail, adding a base to it, rounding out um, edges. He might carve something into it, maybe add a handle. And so he takes his time working on all of these details that bring this specific pot into what it's supposed to be, okay? So um, each part of this pot is for its purpose. It doesn't have to look like every other pot. It's for the purpose that he made it for. So now that he's done with this pot, it has all these different features to it, but it's for the purpose that he made it for. And then he just looks back at it and he just looks at his creation and smiles, and it can be used finally for his purpose, okay? So hopefully you got a few tidbits out of that, but if not, I do have, <laughs> thank you. Um, I do have like a two-fold application that I, I want you to get, okay? So um, above everything, we're all on a different spot on the potter's wheel. Okay, so the internal point that I want you to get is that um, the point is not to become this mindless, I'm just controlled by this pot or I have, you know, I don't think for myself, I'm just this robot. That's, that's not what he's, 
he's doing by shaping you. He wants you to just be willing and receptive to his impact on you and um, to yield to him as you know he's reshaping us to be valuable and useful vessels in his kingdom. So that's the whole point is not just to you know become the same pot as he's making everybody else to be um, because he cares about each and every one of us and has a purpose for each of us. And then um, the, the, the external application that I have is that God's the potter. <laughs> like, duh, right? But we're not the potter, okay? So we tend to try, want to smooth things out for other people. We want to fix people. We want to, uh, you know, we want to have our say, right? But it's not our job or our position, okay? It's his. And the thing is, is that we have pastors and leaders and teachers, and depending on the, the relationship that we have with each other, we can totally speak into each, other, each other's lives and say, hey, I noticed this or whatever, depending on your relationship or the position. So I'm not saying that you should be like, don't tell me about myself. But, but the thing is, is that, you know, we can, we can tell someone to they're blue in the face, we can, you know, we can do whatever. We could just preach and preach and preach on it. But if that person is not yielded to the Lord, nothing's going to happen. And so we have to allow the Lord to change them, the Lord to do that. And so this, this tip specifically for me freed me because uh, a lot of times I take on responsibility that I shouldn't. And so, you know, it, it allowed me to commit some people to the Lord and, and just like let him deal. And I can just pray. I can just pray and stay in my lane. <laughs> right? Right. So, um, I hope that you, you know, you got something from that point. How much time y'all have? Okay. Um, all right. Well, we're, I'm going to go for four. How about that? Okay. So number three, life isn't fair, right? Okay, so I mentioned earlier that we live in a fallen world, and I'm not sure why we're surprised. We like the, you know, the, the Bible tells us we're going to run into things, right? Okay, but the thing that breaks my heart is that a lot of people lose their faith when bad things happen, okay? They don't have a problem saying God is good when things are good, but they have a problem saying that God is good when things are bad, right? So, you know, people try to... to Say, well, you know, because of these things that happen on earth, God must not be real or he must not care. Or how could a good God let these things happen? Things like that. Okay. But he clearly spelled out the fall for us. Right. We, we realize this is why these things happen. We live in this fallen world. And I don't want to, you know, undercut the, the pain that we feel. Trust me, I feel it now. The injustices and the tragedies and the things that we see are horrific. Okay. But it doesn't mean that God's not good, okay? And um, just one more thing, um, if, if you're going through something and you have doubt, that's okay. Because God's not afraid of your doubt because he's the truth. Truth isn't afraid when you, when you question it because it's true. It, it, there's nothing to hide from. Have your questions. Seek out answers. Totally go through that process because your faith will actually get stronger because of it, when you, when you can have that truth to fall back on. But that's why it's so important to have that stable foundation of truth. Pastor Stephen says, uh, if, what is it? If you're ready, you don't have to get ready. Be ready so you don't have to get ready, okay? All right, so um, I just wanna say that, you know, if you have that same stable foundation of truth, when doubt comes, you can doubt your doubts and, and speak to it and you'll be fine, okay? But the reason I wanted to speak about life isn't fair is because there's a little bit of a twist on it, okay? There's a, a message that I heard um, a while ago and I was like, that sounds kind of crazy. And so the, the pastor, he said, life isn't fair and God's not fair. Now, hear me out. And I was like, oh gosh, I don't know, because like God is just, right? And so, just a preface, that sounds crazy, but the reason what he was saying is that there's things in life that, that we get to take part in. There's favor that we have that's not fair to the world, what the world would called fair, and we should praise him for it, okay? So I'm going to give you three ways or three reasons to praise God that life isn't fair, okay? So the first one is that we, oh, actually, first of all, real quick, I have to say, or I have to ask. Who has
has ever messed up in life and was afraid of the consequences. Every hand should go up. Good job. No liars in here. All right. So, first one, okay, is we should praise him for the way that he listens. Okay, we have an instruction book called the Bible, and sometimes we don't follow it, right? So God will tell us not to do something, and then we go do it, and then we go pray to him and ask us to fix the thing that we did that he told us not to do. And humans, we, what did, when your kids do that, what do you do? You're like, I told you so. He doesn't do that to us, right? He listens to our prayer. Like, he shouldn't listen to us. Like, thank God that he listens to us. In Lamentations 3, 22 through 23, it says, Through the Lord's mercies we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Amen. Our compassion as humans is just, just failing, right? We need to take a couple of notes. Um, in Isaiah, oh, I think uh, chapter 9, maybe chapter 5, many, many times, uh, it talks about like all the things that um, the Israel's, you know, all falling. And then it says, my hand is stretched out still. My hand is stretched out still. My hand, he, so each time that they're, they're doing what he said not to do, He's like, but I'm going to lift you up again. Like he listens to us. In Psalm 50, 15, it says, call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. So he's saying, even when you don't listen, when you call out to me, I will listen to you and I will deliver you. We don't deserve that. We don't deserve that, right? So praise God that he's not fair, okay? Number two is the way he forgives. He's willing to forgive all our sins. Our hope is in the mercy and the love of God. And the very definition of mercy is not getting what we deserve. Right? In Psalms 130 and 3, it says, If you, Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? Who? Who of us could stand? In Romans 3, it says, All have sinned. Right? And come short of the glory. Like, would you want the justice that would come? I wouldn't. I would not want it, right? So for this, I just think of the way that he forgives. And I'm trying to be unfair and forgive others when they don't deserve it. That's really, really hard to do. Because we want to be like, you wronged me. You did this to me. But like, be unfair like God and, and forgive them anyway. Forgive them anyway. Trust me, it's free. All right, last, last one. Number three is the way that he helps you make good. Okay? So the way he helps you make good. And that's because he knows our hearts. He knows that we carry regret for the things that we've done in the past. He knows that we're brokenhearted about things. And that even when we acknowledge and thank him and realize that we have already been forgiven we still like hang on to it and a lot of people say this like forgive yourself thing i there's nowhere in the bible that says forgive yourself you are forgiven there that that's not a thing and that's not helpful for people don't teach that um the way that things you can't make up for what you've done. But God is so good that he helps us make good on things because he is a restoring and redemptive God. Okay? So we carry these regrets, but in Psalm uh, 130 and 7 it says, O Israel, hope in the Lord, for the Lord there for with the Lord there is mercy, and with him is abundant redemption. In Joel 2 it talks about the restoration, that he will restore everything, that the canker worm and the all those weird books they, they take for you, right? Like, he's, he will restore those things. So he puts opportunities in our life that, that you can't, like I said, you can't just make up for it, but say someone who went to prison, okay, would go back and work with teenagers who are in trouble, and they would, and, and try to, you know, help them from avoiding those mistakes. Someone who went through certain, you know, uh, maybe an abortion would go and, and talk to young girls and talk about, you know, preventing pregnancy and then the other options and say, hey, this really hurt my heart and this is something that I had to deal, had to live with. Someone, you know, who committed whatever sins, I mean, anything in the world, 
you know, he allows these opportunities in our lives to make good on things. Because, and that's the way that our hearts get healed. It's not from forgiving yourself. That's, that's not a thing. God does it for us. There's nothing for us to do there. Okay? All right. Who's got time for one more? One more. All right, all right, all right. Thank you guys for holding in so long. You guys are awesome. Okay. Last, last truth tool I want you to bring home today is that there is a difference between saved and sold out. Okay? Now, in, in uh, 2 Corinthians 11, Paul was upset because there had been false teachers who had come to the Corinthian church and they had impressed and deceived the people. And so they were, they were thinking all of these things about uh, the Christian life and what it meant to be a Christian. And he was like, all these things are not true. Like these are, these are false teachings. And so he had to like reestablish his credibility with the Corinthians. So he goes on to explain all of these things that he had been through as sacrifices for the faith. And so I'm not going to read uh, directly. I'm just going to list off a bunch of things he said he went through. He said, I went to prison. I was beaten. I was stoned. I was shipwrecked. I had perils of robbers, my own countrymen, Gentiles, wilderness, sea. I was, um, I, dealt, I was dealt with with false brethren. I was hungry. I was thirsty. And he went on and he went on about all of these things that he had suffered for the gospel. Okay? What a life of surrender. We don't see that here in America. We don't, we don't see that. We hear about it overseas. We know people are being killed for Christianity in other, in other countries. We just don't see it here. But... We need to, to recognize that. It could come at any point. The way things are going, we don't know. It could be knocking on our door next week. You know, God forbid. But here we are, okay? But each, um, that's why we, we practice things uh, like, like fasting and prayer. And that's why we start to look at our lives and ask God, what are these things that you need to remove from me? Like, take whatever. Whatever you need, take it from me. And we, each level of surrender takes you, each is like a, a transition to another level with God. You get closer with him. He can trust you. And he, and he really uh, reacts to your obedience to him. And so I don't know about you, but I want a God story. Like, I don't want to have this life of my own making anymore. You know, I did this, and I did that, and I made this money, and then I made this happen. I've got the house, and I, you know, whatever these things that we aspire to do, like, I, I'm just not interested anymore. Like, it's just not exciting to me, I guess. And so when I made that decision a couple years ago, my life really started to change. And so, um, you know, there's a, there's a cost. So when you choose to follow Jesus, there's a cost, and it, and it, it looks different for everybody. Um, you don't, it's not like you have to sell everything you have and be poor or whatever. That's not, not what I'm saying. But, but is the cost worth it? Like whatever it may be that he asks you to put down, is it worth it? Well, let's go to uh, Matthew 13. And, and 44 through 46 is what I'm going to read, okay? Matthew 13, 44 through 46 says, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid. And for joy over, for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, who when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold it, all that he had, and bought it. So he's saying that these two, uh, they're parables, but um, it's basically saying that the kingdom of heaven is more valuable than anything. And it's not about just selling your belongings or it's not really about like a financial thing. It's being willing to forsake all. Whether it's, you know, a relationship, your home, you know, a lifestyle, a job. I left jobs because I, I could, I was convicted. I couldn't stay there. I, there was different, there's, it's, like I said, it's different from everybody. But what we do is that we, we have these things that it's like hard to let go of. We notice it when we try to fast, right? You'll know what, you, what you're stuck on, right? Uh, or, or if you pray and like, you're like, oh, this relationship. But I, I love him. But God's really, mm, I'm going to find a way to work around it. Maybe he'll come around or, you know, whatever. We try to work, work ourselves out. But the thing is, is that 
we have these things because we, we find it hard to let go. And it's not just that it's hard to let go, it's we refuse to let them go. And in the same time, refusing to let them go, we're giving them power over us. Okay, so these things, not we're not only hanging on to these things, but they're gripping us, right? <clears throat> so, but the thing is, is that what you need to know is that these things are preventing you from finding the treasure that Matthew's talking about. Finding the treasure in the kingdom. Finding, when you have the true thing, you don't need any of that other stuff. What are we looking for? What are we looking for? We're looking for purpose. We're looking for value. We're looking for love, attention. We want to feel significant. We need, we need these things. And we, whatever we find them in, you can find them in relationships, food, uh, activities, you know, your lifestyle, the, the things that you have that bring you value, whatever it is. But the thing is, is if we pursue the real treasure of the kingdom, when you find the real relationship with Jesus, you're going to get that acceptance. You're going to get that love. You're going to get that attention. You're going to get everything that you're looking for elsewhere in the world. So, in order to say yes to Jesus, you've got to say no to things. So, like I said, the cost is going to look different from everybody, um, or look different for everyone. Um, every day, we have to choose whether we're going to choose Jesus or, or, or our desires. And it's, it's not an easy thing, it's, it's not an immediate thing, and it's a daily choice. And some days you might choose the other thing, and some days you might choose Jesus, hopefully, over time, you know, you, you, can, you can let it go. But, but Jesus gave us his own uh, example, and he lost his life for us. He, the cross is that symbol of sacrifice for us, and it's our example and um, our reminder. So um, one more thing is that we cry out to him to move these things from our lives, but we don't make space for it. <laughs> Right? So, um, you know, it, it, I just want to tell you guys, like, it might be painful and uncomfortable. It might be weird. It might be different than what you're used to. My life looks different than what it did before. Um, it might be hard for your family and friends to accept it. It might be, you know, they might leave you. Who knows? You know, they might scrutinize you. They'll probably scrutinize you. Um, but I'm telling you, it's worth it. Okay? And I just don't want people... Like, I don't want Christians to just get um, sort of caught up in the fact that you can just be busy. You can go to church on a Sunday. You can be a part of a group. You can serve on a team. You can do all of these things and miss what it means to follow Jesus completely. You can do all of these things but not have a relationship with the one who you're talking about. And so I just, I just don't want us to settle for that kind of Christianity, okay? I want us to just be, be willing to forsake all for the cause and, um, you know, not tr sabotage ourselves from the treasure that living in the kingdom has for us. So, so today I just want to ask you guys to, to just ponder, just think about what is holding you or what are you holding on to in your life that you need to say no to, that's, that's, that you have to say no to in order to say yes to Jesus. Because after you start letting go of these things, your life will transform. And it's that transformation in our lives that people notice. And it causes them to see Jesus in our lives. If they're not listening to what, they, what we say, they could see it. And um, our lives serve as a testimony to the power of Jesus. And it causes the world to change. And that's what we want, right? So think about that today. And... I'm going to close out. Please pray with me, Father. We just thank you, God. Thank you for your word today, Lord. I, I just pray that one of these things dropped into someone's spirit, Lord, that they would be able to take these tools home with them today. Lord, that one of, one of these things would change the way that they look at you, that they see you as, your, as the refiner, as the potter, Lord. Allow you to work in their lives, Lord. Allow you to move within them, Lord. I just pray that they exalt you, that they give you the position that you deserve, Lord, and that they forsake all to, to, to follow you, God. I just pray for each and every voice in here, every person, that they could be bold to speak your truth, Lord, that they would speak your word to those around them, their families, that they would uh, have transformational um, 
transformational lives, that that would be a testimony to those who are lost, Lord, that more people would hear of you and, and would follow you, Lord. So I just pray for everyone that you would touch their families, bless them, reach them, speak to their hearts today, God. We just thank you for your presence, and we just, we praise you today, Lord. Thank you for everything in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't know if we have any altar workers today. If you guys want prayer, please come up. I do have a little bit of a mission really quick. Um, I had a dream during the 10 days, and I don't know. Um, he showed me two people, and I don't have a face. I don't have a name. I don't know if they're present or if they'll be watching later. But I have a message for two people that I need to say um, really quickly. So the first one is that he said that someone um, called out to him and said, I'm invisible. And, and actually asked God, like, do you, do you even see me? Um, I don't know if that's anyone here, but he's saying that he sees you and he is with you. He said he would be with you always. And um, what he said was that he's been trying to show you this, but you have trust issues. And um, so he says, you know, I want to speak to you directly. I want to have a direct relationship with you. I don't want to have to speak through other people, but I will take this opportunity to do so because you don't trust me. So um, if you, if anyone here or anyone watching has, has been asking God, like, do you even see me? Do you know? Because no one here cares that I'm here. I'm invisible to my friends, my family. No one sees me. I just go throughout life. But do you see me? He's saying, I see you and I want a relationship with you. Um, the second person he, get, he gave me um, to address was someone who was asking for an, a sign, specifically a neon sign. He said, they said, if this is like my wager, okay? If you give me one more sign, he's probably given multiple, but I'm saying, if you, if you give me one more sign, I'm gonna take the next step. I'm gonna, I'm gonna join the thing that, that you told me to, or I'm gonna do whatever, whatever that is. You asked for a neon sign. He said, I'm gonna tell you, I'm acknowledging your sign, but I can't give you what you want because he's saying what you're asking for is the, the picture to the puzzle. And he said, I can't show you that. There's a reason I can't show you the answer, the ending, because I need you to have Abraham faith. He said, I need you that when you don't know where you're being led, or you don't know if you're even gonna live, or what's gonna happen to your family, or where you're gonna end up, I need you to trust me and have Abraham faith. So I can't give you that picture, that ending, I can't give you the answer, but what I'm telling you is that I'm acknowledging that you asked for a sign. This is your sign. Do what I told you to do. Okay? So like I said, I don't know if those people are here or if they're going to be watching. That was my dream. So I was being obedient, all right? So if anyone needs prayer, please come up. The altar is open. God bless you. This is Pastor Stephen Worley. Thank you for watching this video. Please like, comment, and subscribe. If you'd like to donate to this ministry, go to shilohub.org. Remember to hit the bell for notifications, and we'll see you next time.